So, Robert, a doctor testifies that a candle fell over in a baby's crib and set the baby on fire. Why does no one think, let's arrest the parent who put a lit candle in a baby's crib? Well, not only one group of parents, I mean, not one set of parents, three multiple parents that seem to be, uh, I, I thought that was great that the Tribune writers, Trish and Sam, they were thinking, wait a second, what kind of a parent puts a candle in a crib? Uh, it's a strange thing, but ultimately it's this sort of selling of doubt. Well, it's a great piece of investigative journalism that comes with that, but this, the, the fact that it took that much it suggests that there's a lack of critical thinking going on that people can hear this testimony and not question that. Yeah, well, I mean, to begin with, there's so little investigative reporting that Sam and Trish took two years uh, to uncover this story and to find out that Dr. Heinbach ultimately was making up this tale. Um, so, uh, and right now, we have fewer and fewer uh, reporters and more and more PR representatives, something like four and a half PR reps to every reporter. Uh, we had a, we are at Columbia Journalism School last week and just amazed how, you know, those investigations are dwindling as we go. So this is based on a book just like Food Inc. was. How exactly do you adapt a book into a documentary? It must not be the same as a narrative where you translate the story. Well, in a funny way, we were inspired by this book, but it wasn't really what became the movie. The book is a great, uh, really important book, sort of outlining what you see in Naomi Oreskes' story uh, here, which is the idea that it was the ideology of Fred Singer and Fred Seitz, two very legitimate scientists, who gave cover to these PR guys like, you know, Steve Malloy and uh, Mark Morano? Uh, it took those legitimate scientists to add cover. Uh, that was their contribution in that book. But in a funny way, um, we had to figure out how to create the present tense aspect of the film. And you know, one of the things that helped inspire it was during the making of Food Inc. I went to a hearing on whether the label cloned meat. I didn't know there was such a thing as clone to me. Uh, and when um, someone from the meat industry stood up and said, I don't think the public should have that information. It would be too much of a burden. It would be way too confusing. I thought something's wrong. Uh, and we looked into it and it turned out to be groups like Citizens for Consumer Freedom, who were funded by the fast food industry, who were out there to deny us that kind of information. And as we looked into it more, they also attacked Mothers Against Drunk Driving and because he defended the alcohol industry. And then he also attacked the Humane Society because it was factory farming. And then that was this guy, Richard Berman, who then went on to the next big payday, which is oil and gas. So was the idea of uh, a magic, the analogy of a magic trick, something from the book or something that came to you for the film? That came sort of halfway through the film. We just kept thinking, how are these guys doing this? You know, for 50 years they created doubt around tobacco when there was no doubt. Uh, they, Peter Sparber was out there convincing people that it wasn't the cigarette that causes house fires, it was couches. You know, maybe we need police to start escorting these couches across state lines because they spontaneously explode. Uh, you know, that makes the candle look like nothing. Uh, and he was really good at it. They were great at it. Um, so, you know, I, I don't know. It just went on and, you know, there were those great stories. I'm sorry, I'm forgetting actually what you just asked. <laughs> the analogy of the magic. Yeah. So as we were going, we realized these guys are magicians. Uh, and slowly, you know, if you say it enough times, you realize, hey, why don't we get a magician uh, to figure out how it's done? And there were those great parallels where um, Steve Malloy, who's unfortunately uh, talked to us for months, we flew to Washington and he backed out at the last second, but he's on Glenn Beck and he says, you know, uh, Glenn Beck says, are you in bed with big oil? And if so, how good are they in bed? And Steve Malloy says, no, I'm just trying to do the right thing. Uh, well, he's being paid huge amounts of money by oil and coal industry, and he's pretending to be an independent 
you know, source trying to figure out what's really happening. And that's what Jamie in Swiss, the magician, says, you know, in the three-card mati, you need someone to win to give confidence. That's sort of what these guys are doing by pretending they're independent. I want to ask the audience, by show of hands, how many people came to this movie already believing in climate change? That's most of the audience. So how do we, those of us here, those of us watching the movie, reach the true deniers of climate change? Well, I don't think we're going to reach the true deniers of climate change necessarily, and I don't think that's, that's you know, the goal. I think the goal of this film is to, you know, sort of help make the media or help get the media to not present this as a debate when it's not a debate. Uh, that we have to, you know, we're not presenting, they're presenting these guys as if they're scientific skeptics when they're PR deniers who are out to just work like lawyers to confuse the situation. So I think as, you know, the public is, you know, confused because the information they're getting is confusing. Uh, and hopefully uh, that will start to rectify itself. And I think it's starting to happen. Uh, but, you know, we need to really be much clearer. Uh, there are groups like Take Part, uh, dot com slash Dow and forecast the facts that are starting these media campaigns uh, to stop calling these guys skeptics when they're deniers to get people off the op-ed pages uh, when they're pretending to be independent sources. Uh, so if we can go help rectify that and present the real information because you know the real debate is what do we do about it uh, and their conservative ideas and their liberal ideas but it's not a debate about science on climate change any more than the earth is round, the earth is flat. Now that Mark Moran has been exposed, has he ended his crusade? Well, in his mind, he probably doesn't think of himself as being exposed. He, uh, I don't think he'll be unhappy with the film necessarily. Was he uh, going to participate in the film? Oh, I didn't trick him in any way. Uh, you know, uh, he knew he knew I didn't believe in climate change. I was making a film, and I would let him have his say. Um, and he more than had his say. Uh, and he's quite charming, quite funny, and thoroughly entertaining to be with. It just his words come up with a great consequence, and we had to juxtapose those words with what happened to those scientists. Well, I mean, I think unfortunately the media is presenting it as if there are two sides again. It's the Earth is round, the Earth is flat. Uh, but that is the problem of, you know, it's a really tricky problem where the media is so used to presenting two sides. I think for the scientists, um, that they look at the world through these skeptical eyes, they're always questioning. They're not necessarily uh, great on television. They're not meant to be on television. Thank God they're out there working 80 hours a week to do the science. I know I couldn't do that for, you know, one hour a week. Uh, but they, their brains are asking questions, they're not outselling, and they're up against these PR reps who are like lawyers who are out to win a case regardless of the facts. And somebody's saying, uh, I just did a Q&A uh, earlier tonight, and someone said, you know, don't we need PR, uh, PR people who can help convince the world that climate change is real? And I think the advantage that these guys have is they don't necessarily have to say the truth. They just have to, as Richard Berman, who came up with Citizens for uh, Consumer uh, Consumer Freedom, has said when he was recorded uh, without him knowing in Colorado in front of an energy conference, he said, we can either uh, lose pretty or win ugly, and we can attack people, we can go after them, we don't need facts. Uh, so. They're playing with a sort of a different hand. They're just trying to delay the obvious. Uh, the scientists are talking about real information, so it's an unbalanced field. Yeah. I, I think, on some levels, I think that this film is more about the playbook than it is about climate change, that it works from tobacco, it works in flame retardants, we could have done pharmaceuticals, uh, certainly food, I saw that, and, you know, Food Inc. was all about how to hide the facts and the lack of transparency. Uh, but today, the biggest payday of them all is energy. That's where the money is. Uh, so that these guys tend to gravitate to where the money is. Uh, if, if the money were someplace else, they'd be there. 
Uh, so, you know, and also I think the consequences of climate are pretty incredibly important. Uh, but I don't think of it as being about climate as much as the ultimate playbook you know, campaign is now centered around climate. And again, like tobacco, what's so fascinating is the science is totally clear. Um, you know, but you know, today in the paper it was uh, Krugman's talking about how you know they're defending uh, certain food products at schools. It's just like the tobacco. I mean, you see the playbook over and over, no matter what the sort of field is. And hopefully, as Jamie Dean Swiss says, once revealed, never concealed, that people will start to hear the same patterns over and over again and recognize them. Well. Um, you know, first of all, I think that, you know, that it's all not, I think people are capable of changing. That, you know, on one hand, I think that in the film we talk about three groups. There's the, uh, obviously, the money and interest that will do everything to defend their, uh, their product, whatever it is. There's the ideological factor that gives cover to that money interest, which is, we're fighting for freedom, we're fighting for democracy. Uh, and then there's that tribal aspect that Michael Shermer talked about, which is, you know, if Al Gore thinks one thing, we think the other. I think that tribe is capable of changing. We see what happened with gay rights. You know, every Republican was against it in 08. Today it becomes an acceptable factor. We see in climate change, uh, the New York Times did poll 48% of Republicans think we should have legislation around climate change. So these things can move. Uh, they're not set in stone. Uh, um, there are occasional days where I have optimism about this. Uh, and that, it, you know, it can happen. And I think, you know, again, I think it's how information is presented. And it's not only Fox News that's presenting it. It was major newspapers that are changing and television station, they're starting to change. And I think as they change, people will realize this is not an ideological issue. Uh, perhaps the solutions might be, uh, but we can begin the real debate, which is what are we going to do about it. Um, but I also think as you see the same group that will be out there constantly, you know, we're going to be attacked as whatever that's going to come with the territory. Uh, but they're going to, you know, I think as those people are out there, hopefully we will see when you hear the word freedom, when you hear the word jobs, you know, the right to work for the coal industry and live in those wonderful towns in West Virginia where they don't have any, you know, running water, whatever it is. That's what we're fighting for. That's the American way. Uh, you know, Obama was talking about the miracle of clean coal in 08 along with McCain. Uh, hopefully we can stop the Democrats as well as the Republicans uh, for not just giving, you know, into those little cliches. And uh, I was did a panel the other night with James Hansen and he said, you know, it's the liberals' fault that we haven't had more action on climate, which I thought was an interesting twist. Uh, and he said, you know, we need a uh, carbon tax, and we need a revenue-neutral carbon tax right away. Uh, and we can't mess it up by saying money should go back to the government, because we're not going to get a right-wing, you know, Republican audience to join in that. But we need this carbon tax, and the money can go back to the taxpayer. So I think there are solutions that will appeal to a right-wing audience. And Bob Inglis is convinced that the vast majority of people in Congress think this is totally true. They're just waiting for their constituencies, who are beginning to catch up pretty quickly. do the second part of the question, okay. which is uh, James Taylor and sort of rolling back solar issues across the country. Uh, one of the things that we filmed that didn't make it in the film was a lady who created, uh, was one of the originators of the Tea Party. Uh, and she's in Georgia and was upset that it's a, uh, that a farmer cannot put solar panels on his property and sell the excess energy. Uh, and there are things like that are happening in Florida, numbers of states, and ALEC, which is one of the groups, and uh, the Cokes, and a number of others are defending this, and they're calling it the Electric Freedom Act to stop you from being able to sell, 
you know, buy solar panels and sell the excess solar. Uh, so there's real strong attempts, but I'm, I'm thinking, you know, in most local areas, uh, Republicans and Democrats are sort of out to get these things to happen. Uh, Republican mayors in coastal towns in Florida see these things as problems. Uh, so, you know, in, in individual areas, I think things can change. And some right-wing groups are thinking, wait a second, there's a certain hypocrisy uh, that people who hate regulations are trying to create new regulations to stop you from having choice. Uh, so hopefully we can stop Alec with the Electric Freedom Act. Again, there's always the word consumer and the word freedom that are in all these groups. So. Well, first of all, we just opened yesterday. <laughs> and if you liked it, please tell your friends and if you really hate it and tell your friends to come here and see it as well. Uh, so uh, hopefully we'll get people and hopefully that will help bring about change. Uh, I think they're certainly a little nervous about it. Um, there's been a lot of uh, buzzing around the internet over this. Um, but, you know, there's still too much self-interest. I mean, they're ultimately there just to confuse people. As you saw there, that Cato report, uh, you know, they're not there to sort of debate the facts. Uh, they're there to, you know, so I think what we have to do is go after the, you know, the people who are voting and the media who's representing that information. Those think tanks are not necessarily going to change. Though Michael Shermer, who said this is disgraceful, he works with Cato. Uh, so he became upset by it. So you are capable of changing certain individuals who are there who ultimately might be thoroughly conservative, but they still are offended by some of the tactics. Well, I think, you know, Bob Inglis certainly did that in a very persuasive way at the end, and I, I, we were moved by that. Um, you know, I think he, I find that moving, you know, I, it, listen, the Pope is now going to come out and do this, and that's going to be a really strong factor. Uh, you know, it's sort of not what the Catholic Church has talked about. Uh, and now they're changing, and the Pope sees this as a major moral issue. And I think that's going to start to have an effect. Uh, and it is, you know, an incredible issue. And James Hansen was saying his research that he's about to publish a major paper, that it's much more frightening than he had ever imagined. Uh, but he, he didn't want to reveal, it, but it's going to be coming out soon. And, you know, it's, it's scary, I and mean, it is a giant moral issue. And um, But, you know, like with the Civil Rights Movement, which was a, a moral issue, you didn't go after the deniers, you didn't go to Bull Connor in the South and say you have to change. You showed images of why this is, you know, this is morally incorrect, and ultimately you brought people around. Um, hopefully we can do it quickly. Well, we know now, uh, the question was about Exxon and the, the deal to drill in the uh, Arctic. We know now uh, that they knew. Uh, as Stan Glantz, the tobacco man, said, these are multi, multi-billion dollar companies, and they have the best internal science that there is. Uh, the problem is it's hard to get documents out of the oil company. Um, you know, Stan was very lucky that he got these delivered to him. Uh, the problem in the oil companies is people have a ton of money that comes to them with their non-disclosure agreement, so people are very reluctant to talk. Uh, but Steve Cole, who wrote a book on Exxon, spoke to one of the managers who said, we totally know what's coming and we're totally planning for it. Uh, and that's where the deal in the art came from. Um, so I think this is something that these companies ultimately have great internal science. Uh, they care about science, they need it to make money. Um, so I, I do think they know. When someone asked me if those guys standing up there and denying uh, that tobacco is addictive is the image you know, uh, of the tobacco war, uh, what's the image of the, <laughs> This you know climate war and you know I think seeing uh, Inhofe throwing snowballs uh, it's, it's one that will probably be replayed many years from now. Mm -hmm. It slows things down ultimately. Uh, you know as 
gas and oil becomes cheaper, people are, uh, you know, less concerned. And, you know, I think what we need is, uh, as George Schultz, right, and Secretary of State said, we need incentives. You know, we need to price this product properly. Uh, we need to uh, put the real cost on carbon. And, uh, and until we have that, the capitalist system will not really work. And he said that the thing that made uh, he and Ronald Reagan most proud when Schultz was Reagan's Secretary of State was putting through the International Ozone Treaty. Uh, that that was something where you need regulations to make it work. Um, and I think, you know, if we price gas uh, and coal properly, uh, and both got rid of subsidies and charged for the cost of all what it's doing to our health and what it's doing to our planet, uh, we would be moving to green energies a lot faster than we Well, I asked Stan Glantz, the man who got the you know, tobacco papers, uh, you know, were these guys lying? And he said, I've learned enough from my lawyer not to say what they were thinking, you know. Uh, he said, I can tell you they absolutely had the information. And actually, one of the characters that we filmed with that we didn't, uh, that didn't make it in the film, uh, had figured out the addiction back in the, I think it was the 60s uh, or 70s. And when he figured it out, he was um, brought the heads of the tobacco company to see his research. And one of the heads of the company said, so this means it's addictive. And his lawyer stepped in between them and said, don't answer that question. And then this guy was flown to New York. And when he came back a few hours later, the place was dismantled. The rats were like taken away. The cables were cut and sliced. And they made a point of not knowing. Uh, I don't know why they're not in jail, <laughs> but as we saw in this film, the judges finally said they have to put uh, out, take out ads saying they lied. Mm -hmm. uh, that's, a, that's a good start, though. Tobacco is still selling a lot of cigarettes, uh, and it's killing unbelievable amounts of people. So they're still doing a good job, but it's you know you don't go to your country club and brag about being a tobacco executive anymore. Uh, and hopefully that will be true for the energy companies. But more about the, the playbook itself, uh, that at least the press will start to question things. I wanted to say before we finish that I'm lucky enough to have many of the people who made this film that are, ha are here tonight. Uh, Melissa Robledo and Kim Roberts and John and Brian and Why don't you guys stand up for a second? Thank you for being here, Mr. Chairman. Thank you all for coming to see Merchants of Dallas.